Um, as Edward said, and my charge here is to knit this together with the regional question. And that's a really hard one, but I'll try. I'll start off by something that I saw in the newspaper a while ago. Perhaps you all saw it too. Uh, it was a picture of a 40-story skyscraper in the middle of Wally uh, that was presumably an agricultural production machine. It had helicopters coming in on the roof, somehow avoiding getting chopped up by the windmills that were there too. <laughs> and uh, it just struck me as uh, we have really lost our minds. <laughs> the, uh, you know, obviously to build a structure like that costs 400 bucks a square foot. And the reason why it does is because it demands a terrific amount of labor, but not just that. Uh, you know, aluminum from uh, the northern part of this country, uh, re-rod from China, uh, concrete that uh, churns out so much carbon dioxide you can't believe it. So we really have a, a huge challenge ahead of us because the work that you're presenting here is, uh, is taking place in an atmosphere of uh, great confusion about these issues. Uh, and I think we're all filled with a lot of trepidation these days. Uh, and agriculture and food comes into it because the, the wonderful machine of capitalism seems to have uh, lost a few uh, gears uh, in its machinery. So the systems that we've come to count on and depend on, uh, production chains that are very long, uh, labor from foreign countries that is much cheaper and that makes us buying food from all over the world, suddenly coming into question. And the logic also, more interestingly to me, of the university, which has said, well, real estate development is the cash cow, and uh, we can get a lot of money on the South Campus for doing that. And indeed they have, but I suspect that, that uh, the uh, pro formas on those projects will also alter in time. So for me, the challenge is, has always been uh, to knit not just uh, food concerns or agricultural concerns by themselves, but into the context of a sustainable region. And thinking back to 1974 when they created the Agricultural Land Reserve, with the brilliant insight that there ought to be food security here, and need an agricultural land reserve in order to do that. It's interesting that the original logics for that have been watered down over time. And unfortunately, in the agricultural land reserve, we see not food security mostly being played out, although to some extent there is, but certainly more than 80% of the land is either tied up in global production of one sort or another, uh, or lying fallow because the economics for agriculture are distorted at the moment. So I think what you've done today is very, very important to highlight the opportunities for community agriculture, really, an agriculture that is tied to both the productive capacities of the people who live within and work on that land, as well as trying to uh, elevate the discussion away from towers full of tomatoes to something that really is uh, economically and socially and uh, agriculturally viable. We've obviously needed a lot. And I, I can tell you from my experience, likely for those younger than me and grown, which is everybody almost, uh, be a lifelong challenge. It will take a lifetime of your efforts. And there'll be some rewards, but there'll also be some uh, disappointments. So to kind of bring it home to uh, the UBC plans and what they could do and what they could still do, first of all, you know, I'm going to start negative and then move on. So the negative is that I and many of you and others have felt that as the university becomes a complete community, the opportunity existed to examine just exactly what that meant to be a complete community. And I and others in this room have been somewhat disappointed that the execution of the complete community seems to be a collection of housing projects which don't appear to knit together visually as a community how do they really function as community? I think there was a brilliant opportunity, not entirely lost, to reconsider what community was 
how living and working and indeed using the green infrastructure that is all around us, not just for agriculture, but also in a respectful way so that the functions of that ecological system were preserved and in fact enhanced over time, knitted together within that matrix the productive capacity of that lands. And why stop at the fields? I always felt that it should be in the yards, it should be on the walls of buildings, it should be on the rooftops, it should be literally a green covering the entire community in some respects. And no degree of intimacy, there is no higher degree of intimacy between what nature is giving you and your community than to try to speculate on that degree of connection. And certainly it's technically feasible. I saw lots of it in your drawings out here. So those were the opportunities, and those still are the opportunities. If there were a way for the collective will of this group and the intelligence to be brought to bear with a vision that is strong enough during this period of great change in our understanding of development, our understanding of what housing is, and our understanding of what sustainability is, there still is this brilliant opportunity for, with the rest of the campus, which is quite substantial, to have a much more sustainable model for the future, with food being a key, if not the key, uh, element of that vision. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you, uh, Edward, and all of you.